Good evening. Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health at East Tennessee State University. And I say that whole introduction uh, mostly for the folks watching us by live stream across the state. Um, welcome to the Leading Voices in Public Health, a truly unique event this evening. Uh, this event features all of the living former commissioners of health for the state of Tennessee going all the way back to 1978. Uh, this this if evening's event began as a rather casual conversation uh, with David Gregory from the Board of Regents, Commissioner Susan Cooper, and Jenny Kidwell from the Tennessee Institute of Public Health. And we were at a legislative breakfast in Nashville, and I was thanking Commissioner Cooper for all she had done for our students and also for being a part of the lecture series. And from that, this idea came, could we actually get all the former commissioners together? And I think we've, uh, you're in for a real treat tonight. This is quite a remarkable perspective on the history of health and public health in Tennessee and by extrapolation nationally. Uh, we're gonna, the way we're going to do it this evening is I'm going to bring the current commissioner up uh, to give an overview of the history of the Department of Health in Tennessee. And then we'll bring the entire group up. So first, it's my very real pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. John Dreisner, the commissioner of health. John is well known to us here at ETSU, a former adjunct faculty member and a frequent attendee at the Leading Voices. Many of you will recognize him as always asking thoughtful and difficult questions. And tonight it's your turn to turn the tables on John. So please join me in welcoming uh, Commissioner Dr. John Dreisman. snapshot of that governmental public health <coughs> that I mentioned, um, almost 5,600 strong, at least at the point that we've we, that we made that snapshot. Uh, but again, that's that governmental public health team that includes both folks that work at the state, uh, for the state health department, folks that work in state health departments at the county level, and folks that work in, in one of our six metro health departments. That's our budget. All sources. Thank you. 
gross excellence, uh, the epidemic of substance abuse, um, uh, infant mortality, obesity and overweight, uh, tobacco abuse, and uh, uh, those are those are some significant focus areas in 2012. That's the Bollinger's framework. We'll talk about that another time. But it's, it's critically important to, to our ability to move forward and move forward in, a, in alignment, in alignment uh, with respect to population health in Tennessee. That's a very sad slide. Uh, that references the overdose deaths that I just mentioned. And you'll notice from that slide that from those bars that accidental death deaths leave in Tennessee. 1,059 Tennesseans lost their lives uh, to drug overdoses. In 2010, more than 8,000 Tennesseans have lost their lives from drug overdoses uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, almost uh, uh, all of those deaths were unintentional accidental overdoses. In for mortality, we're doing better. We have a long way to go. Uh, we find ourselves happily uh, out of the very bottom, uh, but certainly still we have uh, we have far to go. And that, that's in the context uh, of comparing ourselves to a nation uh, that does not prepare well. Amongst the developing nations of the world. Obesity, bright spot, we're doing a little bit better, perhaps, at least, at least uh, a year on trend, uh, but we still certainly have a long way to go you know, with obesity, overweight, and its intended comorbidities. Diabetes, smoking, a little bit of happy news there, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, credit to my colleagues. Because we uh, we uh, not only seeing our smoking rates go down, we're ranking through. Uh, the fact is that our rate of de a decrement, our rate of decrease, uh, is leading and accelerating uh, beyond the national average. Does that mean we can stop here? Certainly not. Uh, and if we're not careful, uh, it will head back up. But at least we see some some tangible results of the work of, of, of leaders and thousands of people around our state. There are our past commissioners. Uh, it turns out I'm the 12th since 1923. Uh, Dr. Eugene Lindsay Bishop, Dr. Wilson Carter Williams, Dr. Robert Hutchison, Dr. Eugene W. Goyle, Mr. James Word is here with us tonight. Juris Doctor, J.W. Luna, who's also here with us tonight. Mr. Russell White, uh, who has who has sat in the parliament. Uh, Dr. Peter Wadley, who I enjoyed spending a few hours with earlier this week. Uh, Ms. Nancy Mickey, Dr. Kenneth Robinson, who I had the pleasure to meet for the first time this evening, and, and my colleague and immediate predecessor, uh, Dr. Susan Cooper. Those are the broad shoulders of leadership that we stand on here in public health. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming the commissioners of the Catholic Club, Susan Cooper, uh, Kenneth Robinson, Frida Wadley, J.W. Luna, and Jim Word. And to serve as our Master of Ceremonies this evening, please join me in welcoming the Vice Chancellor of the Tennessee Board of Regents and a good friend to ETSU, David Gregory. Well, good evening. And it is a it is a distinguished panel uh, that you have in front of you this evening. Uh, I want to welcome each of you. Uh, I particularly want to say a word of welcome to uh, the students. Uh, I uh, appreciate the fact that you have chosen public health as an endeavor, and uh, I think your life will be rewarded because of that. Uh, welcome to uh, Dr. Nolan, Dr. Brian Nolan, the president of East Tennessee State University. And also Dr. Bishop, we'll see Bishop, and uh, what a great uh, team that they uh, make here at this institution. I appreciate Randy um, inviting me to um, moderate this panel for you this evening. I'd like for you to just relax uh, and enjoy the time that is going to be ahead of you. Let me just kind of tell you a little bit so you know what to expect. Um, each of the panelists will address um, questions from me till about 8.15. And then at 8.15, we'll give an opportunity for you, if you like, to ask a couple of questions uh, as, we close out, uh, as we close out our evening. Um, 
it is, a, again, a privilege to, uh, to be here with you this evening. And with no further ado, we're going to get started. First question I'm going, <clears throat> going to address, and, and as you see the commissioners uh, in front of you, um, you, you see them uh, as from the time that they served. Uh, Jim Word um, served from the uh, late 70s, early 80s forward, all the way up to Commissioner uh, Dreisner, who's your present commissioner, and you can kind of see the chronology uh, as well. First question to the panelists uh, is what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment as you served as commissioner? And Jim, if it's all right, I'll start with you. We'll go right across the table. All right. Um, I didn't feel very old till I got here. <laughs> and uh, being 73, when the, th when the thing was flashed up about the former commissioners, I knew every one of them from Carter Williams. The only one I didn't know was the first one who served for one year. I personally knew Art Hutchinson Sr. because he was the commissioner that Gene Fowinkle followed and I was Gene Fowinkle's deputy. So as I talk about it, it'll be impossible for me to separate myself from Gene Fowinkle because he's my mentor uh, and he probably is without a doubt other than R. H. Hutchinson Sr., the, the best commissioner and the most notorious in terms of, of being famous outside the walls of the state uh, that, that, uh, that I know. And unfortunately, we lost him uh, earlier in the year. Uh, I've thought about the question of, of what, do I, what do I think is the best thing we did, and I have to tie that back to what Gene Fowinkle and I did. We came actually in 1969. Governor Buford Ellington was the governor, a Democrat. We served under Republicans and Democrat, and I left uh, during the second term of McWhorter. So I was there 25 years. And I think the most important thing we accomplished in public health is if you think about it, there roughly, Hutchinson served almost 40 years and we served 25. So that's 65 years. Carter, Carter Williams, I don't remember what he served, but he didn't serve long. So the biggest spell, so to speak, of service is represented by Dr. Fowinkle and myself. The one thing that we did, we created a national reputation for the health department. Now, it really wasn't the health department. It was Medicaid. We implemented Medicaid in 1969, July of 1969, huge program. We ran the public health program that, that you heard the good doctor describe. And we also implemented the environmental programs of the 70s. And I'm, all of you are too young, but if you were older, uh, you would be throwing rocks at me. I've been spit on in Johnson City. I've been buried in Bumpus Cove. Uh, I've had to deal with the, the disperser coming off of the, off of the uh, sewer pipe, uh, the tertiary treatment plant in Johnson City. So uh, I've been here before. Uh, uh, I've, I've been here really. But the best thing that I think we did was create a department that had a national reputation, that had credibility, that had people who stayed in the department uh, and who lived there. So I guess I'm going to take some credit for having been a small part of ensuring that the health department was in good hands when JW took it over and was in good enough hands that that Frida couldn't mess it up despite how hard she tried. Uh, and we still have a good health department today. I mean, Susan and all the other folks uh, did a great job. But what they're doing today is different than what Gene and I were doing and what JW did, frankly. I mean, we were running a tripartite department that was three big tentacles. So I guess to answer the question, I'll take some responsibility for having put in place a system that stood the test of time. J.W. Looney, and I'd ask each, each of you panelists, as you begin to answer, just describe the period of time that you served. The thing when I look back that I thought was the greatest potential for public health was something called Health Information Tennessee on a website. And eventually it was 15 state health databases integrated by county, that was the geographic unit, started out with 10 years historical data so that you could trend it, had a very robust query capability so that any data element in any of those data sets 
could be queried, you could compare county to county, county to region, county to state, county to nation, region to region. Uh, fantastic capability. It also was placed on uh, internet so that in a very interactive uh, website with a tutorial. It had the capability also if you had presentations to do uh, graphs and charts and make them right there on the website. Very low cost. I actually went outside the department and got Dr. Sandra Putnam at UT to put that together. Open source code, uh, very low cost, very low cost maintenance. And also was the format that we pulled data from five state departments for children's information. At that time and at this time, I'm even more convinced that if you want to engage communities and if you want to sell what you're doing in public health, as well as be accountable for the money that you get invested into public health, then you have to have very accessible data. And that data was used by public health professionals, by academic institutions, by students. We actually had one call up from Oregon one Sunday night because the website was being updated. And she said, you got to get it back on. I've got a thesis I've got to get done by tomorrow. She did like I did. She waited to the last minute. But anyhow, um, very important, and I think it's still important to have that going forward for what we want to do in public health. Dr. Kenneth Robinson, Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kenneth Robinson, and I served from 2003 to 2007. And I think already what you've heard is that uh, with successive health commissioners, we were able to supplement, build upon, and really not duplicate what our predecessors were doing. Um, I came with a, a very clear uh, orientation when I came into the department. And by the end of my tenure, I think uh, that what I was uh, really wanting to talk about tonight, I was able to successfully create a leadership level awareness and focus on racial and ethnic health disparities. Uh, it was uh, very much a part of my uh, interest. It had been for many years. It was known to Governor Bredesen uh, when I came. And pretty much when you uh, appoint a health commissioner, uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, what we have done in the past is pretty much what we will do uh, when we get into these positions. Uh, I accomplished that with a very deliberate and strategic uh, fashion. And I was hopefully uh, going to uh, get this priority embedded in the Tennessee Department of Health, and I think it is indeed there. Uh, we started with our historically poor uh, state health rankings. Uh, uh, I am looking over at uh, Dean Randy. Uh, at the time, uh, we were 48th in the state, uh, in the nation, and uh, we were wearing buttons that had uh, the red line across the number 48. Uh, and I identified the things that were the usual suspects, heart disease, diabetes. We were also at the bottom of the uh, uh, rankings in terms of infant mortality uh, rates uh, among our peer states. Uh, but what was key for me and what was really critical for my own public health agenda was that these were issues that really cut across the state. Uh, that there were issues about heart disease and diabetes and infant mortality in every legislative district in every county. That was really critical for me as a starting point. Uh, my intent was that if we educated the legislators, if we could uh, really uh, bring the public into understanding the issues about adolescent pregnancy and infant mortality rates and diabetes and people understood about having heart attacks, people understood about uh, having amputations, people understood about having to go on dialysis. If we could talk about babies who were dying and legislators would understand that this was happening in all of their counties, then I knew that there was a subset that there was within these uh, very poor health outcomes and statistics statewide, that there was a subset. Uh, there were some demographic and some geographic hotspots. There were places in the state that were worse than others. Uh, there were places like Sullivan County that had some significant um, uh, poor uh, public health outcomes that were hotspots. And there were demographic hotspots. There were racial and ethnic disparities. There were populations in the state that were disproportionately impacted uh, by heart disease, diabetes, infant mortality reduction. So um, that became a theme for me. It was uh, hopefully moving towards one state 
in an excellent state of health. One state, not with some populations healthier than others, not with huge disparities uh, that were socioeconomic and racial and ethnic in nature, but really pushing for one state in one excellent state of health. Pushed that out, pushed it out of the um, Tennessee Department of Health, pushed it out of the Cordell uh, Hall building, pushed it out into the regions, out into all of the county health departments. Um, and uh, for me, what was key uh, was really building strong relationships with uh, community-based organizations, with community-based stakeholders, community-based natural leaders, and helping our health department local uh, officials uh, recognize how to do this. And we developed tools. We brought in the American Heart Association to introduce the Search Your Heart curriculum, uh, which was a wonderful curriculum that the Heart Association had been doing here and there, but to give them a statewide platform to develop Search Your Heart and teach our health department uh, personnel how to work with the faith community. We uh, partnered with the, uh, the Emory School of Public Health and again develop interfaces and models of interface between public health and the community. Um, we contracted with TenCare uh, to bring uh, TenCare moms uh, uh, into a call center so that moms would have natural affinity with other mothers with whom they were talking so that they could help those mothers get their newborns and children into care. Mothers who looked like them, mothers who could relate to them. Uh, tools, we expanded the home visitation programs. And knowing that this was a uh, time-proven, time-tested approach to decreasing infant mortality and managed to get that into many, many other uh, counties, as a matter of fact, home visitation programs in every county uh, in the state. Um, we followed the data, were able to redirect some uh, state funding by following the data. Uh, we published a landmark report on the health status of healthy communities of color, uh, institutionalized the Office of Minority Health I was very pleased about that because my mantra became that if we could really turn around the health status of our racial and ethnic minorities in the state, we could really move the needle in terms of the health status of the state and get off the bottom of the pile. Ms. Susan Cooper. Well, I feel like I'm at home. I, I, I want to say first to the students, I sure am glad to see you all again. And so thanks for having us tonight. As commissioner from 2007 till middle of September of 2011. And I think, you know, it was the time of my life. I loved every single minute of every single day. Most of you know I love some minutes more than others, but I did love them all nonetheless. And I think the single most important thing that occurred during that time, which really set us on the trajectory toward improving population health in this state, was tobacco, the Non-Smoker Protection Act, tripling of the tax, and finally getting some money for prevention and cessation to push out to the counties. And I think, you know, it, it, the strategy for doing that was it, with tobacco beating, being the leading cause of preventable death in this nation that we needed to do the hard things first because who in the world thought we'd do it in one year? We thought we had like a four-year trajectory ahead of us. And so with Governor Bredesen's leadership, with partners in every single community in this state, I think we really did make a difference in the lives of not just folks here in Tennessee, but it set a standard in the South for other Southern states to start pushing this agenda so when you see Virginia going smoke free and you see North Carolina moving in that direction you know I think the work that our partners did which has been a theme throughout the whole five years was how do we all work together to improve the health of our neighbors so tobacco 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 <laughs> Mr. Dreiser, this is a little bit unfair to ask you since you've been in office for such a short time, but I give you a swing at it. I found my car keys this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I think maybe I think maybe the uh, you know if if uh, if if anything, uh, it's the uh, the ability to recognize uh, that the folks that came before me uh, have given me a, a terrific toolkit uh, and a great group of people. Uh, you can you can hear the passion. Uh, in the voice of each commissioner uh, down this line, and it's it's really astounding, and uh, and that passion you'll find that in in our dedicated uh, public health workforce all over the state, 
um, it's infectious. I think public health is a passionate field to begin with. People wouldn't uh, get into public health, I don't think, uh, unless they had some passion for it and, and, and some real understanding of the systems issues that are involved in, in population health. Um, but, uh, you know, an accomplishment to recognize that legacy and, uh, and be ready to build on it. The next question I'm about to pose to the panelists has to do with the, uh, the largest challenge that they faced as they were commissioner. Uh, before I do that, I want to make sure you're sort of tracking along with the discussion. You've heard uh, Commissioner Word talk about sort of overseeing three uh, sort of distinct departments and Commissioner Luna being uh, a part of that uh, as well. I want you to understand at one point in time in the, in the governance structure of the state, you had your uh, environmental programs such as the air regulation programs, your solid and hazardous waste programs, your epidemiology programs incorporated in your traditional public health programs such as the county health departments, the prenatal, perinatal programs, the licensure programs, as well as the precursor to TennCare, the Medicaid program. So at one point in time, all of those programs were a part of a single department. You've heard that referred to as a mega department. All right, let's move now into the question of, as you, as you think about your tenure and term as commissioner, what do you feel like was your greatest challenge? Commissioner Word. Well, <clears throat> I'm I probably look at this a little differently than uh, some, but to me the, the greatest challenge is that the people who make our laws, by and large, I'll call it, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the Mitt Romney affect. If you listen to Mitt Romney, you would believe that only people who couldn't get jobs in the private sector would go to work in the government. And that's patently untrue. Uh, you would believe that what you need to run your government is a good person who's run a private business. In fact, there are different skills required for each of those. And as much as I tried to get that message out, uh, I could only get it out one way, and that was I had to personally recruit people, good people into government, because I do not believe Mitt Romney or anybody else who says that the only way to to get a good uh, worker is to get somebody from the private sector. Uh, if you think about what's done in the public sector, maybe too much is done in the public sector. That's plausible. But, but the who's doing it is quite another matter. So I guess my greatest disappointment was I, I served in f under five governors. I had to listen to that five times. And, and I really thought, that God had abandoned me. <laughs> because here I am believing that I grew up in a town of 4,000. I got myself educated beyond my ability to be educated. And here I am in the best job I've ever had and everybody thinks I'm the scum of the earth. <laughs> my wife is teaching school and everybody knows her and I live in Hendersonville and nobody knows me or gives a damn. <laughs> so it, that for me, uh, is, is a major issue. Uh, I don't think I'll get it resolved before I die. Uh, according to national statistics, I've only got six years, so you'll probably be the last public audience to hear that. But for me, one of the big concerns I have is that the political rhetoric would lead you to believe that good people should not go into government. I can tell you, I worked in the hospital industry, I worked in the golf industry. I worked for the Corps of Engineers. And never in my life have I seen better people than the people who work in public health. Greatest challenge. Later for more. Greatest, <laughs> greatest challenge, J.W. Luna. And I get to follow that, huh? My phone rings in May of 1988. I'm 36 years old, have no health care, discipline background period. I'm a lawyer, I'm a prosecutor, and uh, I'm serving as the commissioner of personnel for maybe the most powerful person ever lived in the state of Tennessee, Ned McQuirter. Amen. Phone rings and it's a governor's chief of staff who, happened, who developed into my best friend and told me that Jim Word come to see the governor and he was gonna retire and that uh, 
the governor was thinking about putting me in the massive Department of Health and Environment, the biggest department of state government. Keep in mind, he's my friend, and I, I guess I had to clean up my story a little bit, David, because we are, bit, Mr. President, uh, better watch my profanity, I guess. But I said, well, Mr. Kennedy, uh, I can spell health. I can't spell environment. What the heck do I know about that job? And he replied, you can spell one word, McWhorter. And uh, I explained what I was a political operative, Governor McWhorter. I'd helped get him elected. We'd announced up here at Rocky Mountain, East Tennessee. We'd been elected, and I was part of his inner circle, and he decided rather than put a health care professional in the department, he would put one of his, uh, his uh, political aides and closest advisors. So I'm 36, I go over to the Department of Health and Environment, and, I, and I'm following a legendary team. And I said, I, I shouldn't say this, that's what word's been saying, but I'm following legends. Dr. Eugene Fowinkle had come up here in 1969 and brought this joker with him. And the two of them had run the department for 20 years with the woman on my left as their, as their chief medical officer for a big chunk of that. So I'm now put into a situation, uh, and I inherited a tremendously deep bench. The challenge was following legends. We all know the people that follow Bear Bryant. We know the stories that usually the first person who follows a legend doesn't last too long, and then you then move on. But uh, I'm very proud, and I was telling Jim earlier, I hadn't seen him in, in several years till we got together earlier, that in reflecting back and looking at the history of, for this program tonight, I changed out one person in the senior management team. He asked me who it was, not going to repeat it tonight, but I thought I had one weak link. So I changed that one weak link, and then we built from there. And then we worked our rear ends off for the people of Tennessee. Ned McWhorter expected hands-on, tough, day-in and day-out management. If I had time, I could just go rattling off what the team they built, this young man, David Gregory, was one of that team. His office was two doors down from me. He's now your vice chancellor. He was one of the youngsters. And as David can say, we then worked for the people of Tennessee 16 hours a day, the team they built, round the clock, solving Medicaid problems, uh, 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 telling the state of North Carolina, we don't care if you drink Jack Daniels or not, we're going to clean up the Pigeon River. And we're going to not let you pollute the Pigeon River with your paper mill in North Carolina. We're, you will clean it up. And uh, you're too young, uh, most people in the audience are too young to know about the crisis of the Pigeon River. We're going to both protect rivers and streams and creeks, but on the other hand, environmentalists get a life. We're also going to have economic development. We're going to have a Cool Springs Mall in Williamson County. A creek runs under it. We'll find a way to do both. We'll find a way to protect the streams, but we'll also have economic development. We'll have a Turkey Creek in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll find a way to protect the wetlands in Knoxville, but we'll still have the development. And we worked around the clock for a long period of time. But the toughest challenge was going in as a jack leg lawyer. That's what I like to call myself in my speeches, where the law five years earlier had required an MD in the position. The law was changed for Commissioner Word with his public health background in 1983 to take over. Five years later, then I, as a lawyer, go in. But the greatest challenge was following this team of folks and building upon what they left behind. Frida Wadley, greatest challenge. When I look back, it really wasn't in the commissioner years. It was probably as, as chief medical officer, and word assigned me to an HIV AIDS task force. Every time we had a meeting, I'd come back and tell him I was going to quit. Remember that? <laughs> you can't quit. Here's the stage. All of a sudden, we had this infection that was fatal, and there was no treatment. And Primarily at that time, the ones known to be infected were the gay population and drug users. So they didn't have a lot of sympathy with them. And then we had a public that was in hysteria. And their way to deal with this was anybody that is infected needs to be separated, locked up. That's the way you protect the public. And then we developed a test so that you knew those that had the infection that could infect. And after that, there was a great debate. Do we make this 
a mandated reportable infection. Greatest challenge is dealing with this URI that I have tonight. Um, probably knowing that the clock was ticking on my tenure was the greatest challenge. The wheels do not move very rapidly in state government. And there are times that people know that uh, commissioners have a tenure, and if they can wait you out, um, and, uh, whatever you were interested in, this too shall pass. Uh, I have the privilege of following Frida Wattman, who had done some extraordinary and innovative things in the Department of Health. And I really came in with a very ambitious agenda as well. My greatest challenge, frankly, was 10 care, 10 care, 10 care. And this is about public health 101 and being a commissioner of the Department of Health and that one has to deal with what one is dealt. And uh, despite my agenda, despite the things that I wanted to do with the Department of Health, uh, Commissioner Luna, the state was still swimming uh, under the, uh, the flood, the tsunami of uh, unchecked costs for 10 care. Uh, the intent at the initiation of 10 care had been to cap Medicaid expenditures in the state budget around 14%. We were at a quarter of the budget of Commissioner Cooper at the time. And the reality is that Governor Bredesen uh, did a very bold and, and critical and necessary thing in addressing the issue of doing some categorical reductions in 10 care. Well, uh, I was uh, a significant public face of health. Uh, never mind that uh, the Bureau of 10 care was not in the Department of Health. Uh, but I was, to many uh, constituents, the face of health. And um, Governor Bredesen uh, really utilized that opportunity to get us out and to talk about the fact that TenCare was cannibalizing uh, the state budget. Uh, what we also had the opportunity to do, however, was to craft some very creative approaches with um, the woman who turned out to be my successor in the Department of Health. And Commissioner Cooper was working with the governor's office at the time. And uh, we're very pleased that we were able uh, for some of the disenrollees who tend care to create the permanent presence of primary care in 48 additional uh, counties uh, that did not have primary care presence. We really uh, lost uh, primary care in the local health departments in many of our counties. Uh, I was really able to propose a working in a creative way with the federally qualified health centers uh, uh, 24 health centers working in 80 sites to give additional state supplemental funding uh, for their federal funding to somehow mitigate the impact of disenrollment for some uh, 10 care enrollees. And I was very pleased to be able to uh, work with uh, 60 community-based and faith-based uh, health centers uh, that were going to expand their capacity to take care of disenrolled 10 care um, enrollees. Now the problem is uh, that I've been uh, a lifelong advocate for universal care. And I've been on the record, I've written publications, and, and so this was a very painful period for me as commissioner. And while I understood the administrative priority, while I understood certainly the governor's priority, and while it really made sense to me because we shortly thereafter were able to further expand the budget of our state health departments that have been severely truncated by the cannibalization of the ten care budget. I understood the reason for it, but it certainly deterred me and detoured me from a primary public health agenda in some ways, and and uh, frankly uh, placed me at odds with uh, many of my traditional friends, the faith community, uh, persons in the legislature, uh, ten care advocates, uh, community activists. Uh, it was a very challenging time. I think at the end of the day, uh, it turned out well. It turned out well for the governor. It turned out well for the state. Mr. Cook. No how to follow that. Um, so I'll lighten up the room a little bit. Uh, we've got all these horrible things we're talking about. And we've all faced our challenges. But um, I could reflect back and tell you the hardest things we faced were see natural disasters. First month we had the supercell tornadoes that went from Memphis all the way through Middle Tennessee. We had ice storms and a little thing called the flood. You can notice we have lots of F words here. We had the flu, nothing like a pandemic in the midst of your, your tenure there. We had formaldehyde and FEMA trailers. 
I didn't know anything about from Alpine or anything about that trade was for that uh, moment. But all of those things are doable because of the extraordinary people that you work with. And, you know, it's, I think a common thing that you've heard from across the commissioners is that there are stellar folks that work for state government. And they certainly don't get to do. You know, they don't get the attaboys that they really need. The major challenge, though, with that is not just about the folks that work in public health, it's that we don't have a champion for public health at the national level. When you look at Congress, people understand health care. They're really, I mean, I think back to your slide, the less than 1%, it's about three cents on a dollar, maybe on a good day, that goes to investments in public health at this time. And when you hear the rhetoric now in, in Congress about money, which is again spent on the health care side, not recognizing that if you improve health, you would diminish those costs greatly over time. You hear the discussion of, well, there's money in the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which for the first time in history, we had money put aside to invest in health. But that's going to be, become one of the bargaining chips. So the money that's finally been invested is going to be at risk for becoming a trade-off in this discussion around health reform. I think our challenge is that sometimes we're not very good about talking about what public health is. You know, if, if you ask anybody in this room, you might get 73 different answers if you ask 73 different people. And the general public doesn't know what public health is. If you talk to the general public, they don't know we're there if we do our jobs well. They know who look to you if there's an emergency, if there is from out hiding and FEMA trouble, or if there are problems with the water. But they don't know to look for you to you for that population health education piece. They think that's going to be provided in the seven-minute visit you happen to get in the healthcare provider's office. And it's just not going to occur. And so this challenge of not having a champion in Washington to say this is important, not having the funding to invest in health, not having a clear message of what it is we do, it will continue to be a challenge for those that follow us. And so I would urge all of you, especially the young, bright minds in this audience, to help us think about how do we repackage public health for the future? How do we start saying, what are we going to start doing? no science for some of the things we do. So let's invest in those things that are grounded in that evidence. Let's create our message. And let's put public health on the map and give it a face. Well, thank you for that segment. Because that's, that's it. We are in public health a mile wide and a mile deep. We do things that most people don't understand what we do. You can't live in this country without being touched by public health every single day. It's not possible. The challenge really is, and part of the reason I, I think so highly of the, uh, of the Baldwin framework, for performance excellence, uh, it's a framework within which there are a lot of different tools. And the challenge really is, getting that mile deep, mile wide entity, um, which includes that governmental public health workforce that I mentioned, but also includes those folks that are primarily engaged in health care. It includes many different nonprofit interest groups all over the country. It includes the private sector. Uh, there are a tremendous number of people engaged in workplace health and wellness from physicians to nurses to administrative folks. These are all really a part of the population health team. And, and as Susan just mentioned, as what I mentioned in the slide, when, when people think of, of health, they really think of health care. They add those four words, four, four letter word after health. And, and that's okay, I mean, that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, we all, uh, we'll need health care at some point in our lives. Many of us need health care on a regular basis, and if we don't, our children do, our grandchildren do, our parents do. Um, so health care is critically important. 
but as I, as I tell my folks uh, often, and, and, uh, and as folks in the media understand, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, when, you're, when you're working in the care realm, it is a priority. It has to be a priority because people that are there in front of you, they have real needs and they need to be addressed. But when you're working in public health, we have to keep our focus, our eye on the ball, of population health. So the challenge is really to take that mile wide and mile deep group of folks, and over the years you, 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 you saw it fall off. You know, public health used to include uh, Medicaid, it became TennCare. It used to include environmental health. Um, uh, in many states it still does. In Tennessee, it doesn't. Um, however, even, even in, a, in a smaller agency, uh, we still have well more than 3,000 people doing a lot of different things. Uh, we have an entire regulatory uh, area, uh, health licensure and regulation, where we have 244, actually the last count, 248,000 licensed health professionals in Tennessee. We regulate 1,800 health care facilities. We have a lot of, of, of pieces of the puzzle. 2.3 million visits every year, almost 900,000 unduplicated clients. About one in six Tennesseans has a health department touch. So. How do we get all those people that are very, very passionate about what they do, very passionate, um, and, and get them aligned in the direction of population health and pulling in the same direction? Not that they all need to do the same thing, that's not it. But everybody needs to understand how they fit in to the population health picture, how they uh, either are or can be a part of primary prevention. That's where the savings is. There's not much savings in secondary and certainly not in tertiary prevention overall. I'm not an economist, but, but, but uh, that's what I understand from, from the literature that I've looked at over the years. And getting that alignment really requires deliberateness in, in going about it, and that's what the Baldrige framework provides. So that, that will be, I hope, my challenge, and, and if I'm lucky, uh, it, it may be something that I, uh, in later years, will come here and say uh, I'm very proud of. Thanks. Give so, word if you would. Lessons learned. Hi, my dad. Yep. Um, I had the opportunity in those 25 years I spent in public health to visit 95 counties. I never, you may have noticed, I don't take myself too seriously. I take what I do seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. Um, and I never thought that was a problem. But in visiting 95 counties, I decided I'd give out five-year awards. And I had visited 94 counties. I was going back to Nashville in the, in the rain. And I had to go to Sequatchie County to make a five-year presentation to a girl, who, a young lady who'd been with the department less than five years. So I get to Sequatchie County. I pull in the parking lot, and you wouldn't believe it. There was a line from here to, from here to North West Tennessee, uh, people who were in line to get WIC vouchers, it's raining, they all got umbrellas, and here I am in a state car. And so I pull up my executive, I said, I ain't, I'm not going in there. She said, you're going in there. I said, I'm not going in there. There's no way. The lady in there, all I'm going to do is add misery to her day. So I mind women, so I, I went, despite my reticence to do so, I went. I walked to the front of the line. There was a very young, pretty lady sitting there. And um, I said, I'm Jim Word, the commissioner. I came to make you a five-year presentation. She jumped up and she hugged me like you would think I gave her money. <laughs> and I thought about that for a long time. So the point I'm trying to make is that you know who you are, but when you're in a position like being commissioner, people want to think the best of you. And that young lady, I, I saw that young lady two years later when I was making a presentation. And I was telling that story, and I looked out, and over in the corner was this pretty little lady, and she had tears in her eyes. She had just been promoted to a regional manager. And I said to her, you're that girl, aren't you? She said, yes, I am and you'll never know how much of an impression you made. So little things are big things. Lessons learned, Jacob.
think we practiced this. I really hadn't seen him in years, but uh, uh, my answer is about the same. The, the greatest lesson I learned, what a fantastic state of Tennessee we have. I had the opportunity to have my dream jobs in my 30s, early 40s. I served all eight years in Governor McWhorter's cabinet in four different uh, agencies. This was my most fun agency to, to run. Uh, I traveled this state from one end to the next with him. I was in every county in the state. I don't want to one-up you, Jim, but I was going to say twice. But, uh, uh, and, and I love coming to East Tennessee. I love coming up here and finding people like Paul Stanton, getting in the car when he was dean of the medical school, driving to Mountain City, meeting up with Jimmy Quillen up there, making things happen, and, and just going around. And just all across this uh, uh, upper East Tennessee was a second home to me. Uh, and I, I do want to acknowledge, I think I see some of my old friends. I asked about the Gump family over dinner, and I believe they're back in the audience if I can see them. And it's wonderful to see you. Haven't seen you in a long time. But I love coming up here, staying at Robin's Roost with John Love and his wife at their house and traveling around. And this state is just a beautiful state. It's got fantastic people. And I am so excited to be invited to be here, Professor Wyckoff, tonight. Nothing more than having dinner with your wonderful students who are here. Had a fantastic conversation. They're great kids, and they're going to do well. And, and, and you're doing a fantastic job in educating them. I and thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. Lessons learned, Dr. Wadley. We don't have control of the money. We don't have control of the decision. And it was pointed out earlier, we may have a big budget but there's very few discretionary dollars. And the second part of the skill uh, that I found that you have to have is that political savvy. You may think that's a dirty word, but if you can't play that game, you don't win the game. And then third, you have to have a little grit. You have to push that envelope. Even though you may be pushing that envelope and the governor is going to come down on it, but there's just some times you have to take a risk. So it's a lot of things that make up what we can do, but I think those are some lessons I learned that it took more than just the knowledge of public health to be able to achieve anything. And that's a great segue to my lesson learned because I think um, I learned how to be multilingual, uh, how to translate my own public health priorities into a language that multiple audiences could appreciate, multiple audiences from whom I needed support and endorsement and funding uh, so that some audiences could respond to the ethical argument, the moral imperative, that what we were doing in public health was just the right thing to do. Some people do respond to that and, uh, and that is gratifying. Others responded to uh, the political argument and that what we were doing would help them with their base, with their constituency, it would build a bridge back from state government, back into the local community. It would be helpful for them to maintain uh, the positions that they had and it would be popular with their electorate. And for others, uh, there was the fiscal argument. And, and simply uh, for me, uh, particularly with the agenda, the public health agenda that I had, it was very important uh, to uh, make the point and to translate my agenda into a language that better health saves money, uh, that better health reduces costs. And when we were wrestling with the impact of TennCare upon the state's budget, that made a lot of sense to legislators who otherwise would not have been as interested in the agenda that I was proposing and forwarding at the time that I was um, a commissioner. It allowed me to uh, befriend and work collegially with uh, legislators from all across the state who either understood the moral imperative, the ethical argument, the political argument, or the fiscal issue, multilingual. Seems like I learned something new every day. Um, but some of the greatest lessons were um, to remember that you were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. And so if you get out of Nashville, where public health really does take place out in the communities, and you listen, you can learn from those that are on the ground. And you have to be willing to let your guard down in these positions and say that there are people that know a whole lot more than you do. And if you listen, the dialogue that takes place really helps inform your decisions. I think you have to be able to take a lot of information in a very short uh, period of time, crystallize it to come up with one, two, or three key points, and that's it. And you have to be willing to say 
you know, let's give credit to the folks who are really doing the work. You know, to be able to go represent the folks that work in the great state of Tennessee, their work around preparedness, their work around improving population health, to present that in, you know, at Congress or at the Institute of Medicine, all these places to say Tennessee should be looked at as the shining of example of a state where things can get done, not can't get done. So take can't out of your language and look at all the things you can do. Um, last question of the evening, then I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, uh, make a stab at the panelists here. Uh, but this, I'm really interested in hearing the answer to the, what you see to be Tennessee's greatest cha public health challenges now as we go into the future. I think it's a great question and look forward to hear what you have to say, Jim Ward. 25 years ago, my boss, Ned McQuarter, was sworn in as governor after having campaigned across the state and on four basic th themes. One of them was affordable and accessible health care was one of his four uh, goals. Uh, we did, we worked hard. We uh, uh, asked tonight some of these uh, uh, students and others if it's still in the works, the programs that we created where we found we used the unclaimed property fund of the state of Tennessee to fund scholarships for our primary care providers who would commit for a period of time to go to the underserved areas of rural Tennessee and the inner city. We created community health agencies to try to maximize federal dollars and all types of funding so we could fill gaps in, in, the, in the needs of uh, accessibility to health care. 25 years later, notwithstanding all those efforts, single biggest issue facing all of America, I think, is accessibility to health care. Susan's are recovered. And that is, they don't know what we do. Most of them don't care. We don't have a real good advocacy group. And I used to say a place like mental health or developmental disabilities, and they lobbied at the Legislative Plaza. I used to say I'd kill for a group like that. But we have so many programs, so many vulnerable groups that you didn't have a strong advocacy, and therefore, you often just got left out. And then as the emphasis was on health care, then public health really got left out. And I think that's you know, part of this, the problem of us being able to say what we do. It's easier back when it's mainly controlling uh, infectious diseases. But it's very complicated now because the problems are very but somehow we have to do better at educating people about what we are, what we do, and why we need the resources, or we won't get any better. Well, I could very much agree with uh, <coughs> these commissioners that it is about uh, ultimately those who are voiceless, uh, the least, the last, the lost. And in these days, when it seems as if those who are the loudest uh, get the most attention, uh, for those of us in public health, we still have to understand that we have to be the advocates for those that have no voices or for, or for those whom others will not listen to. And so it, it is critical. It is to find sustainable reimbursement, sustainable funding uh, for those persons. It is about uh, holding up the banner of public health. It is about being the visionary and the highly visible uh, leaders with the voice and getting the attention of public policy makers. And even when we are not commissioners any longer, I think the challenge is for us to remain in the fray and to do what we are doing in the uh, various other um, areas of endeavor uh, that we leave. I, I hope that public health will continue to do uh, what we've all set up here, and that is to get out of the ivory tower, get back into the community, work with uh, multiple uh, multi-stakeholders to get into community-based organizations, get back to the streets, to the people, as Commissioner Cooper has indicated. And that is really what will allow us to keep our finger on the pulse and then to speak for those who cannot speak effectively for themselves. Well, I'm going to agree with them since they agree with me. But I'm going to say one more thing. I think if we don't get a handle on obesity, childhood obesity, which impacts maternal child health, it impacts chronic disease, 
It impacts learning in, in schools. I, I think it is absolutely imperative for us to help contribute to building the evidence base in this new world we find ourselves. Because if we don't, if that rate continues to climb, we're just going to see more heart disease, more stroke, more deaths, more cancer. And um, so I'll take a disease approach there. Um, this, is, this is an opportunity for you now. If you uh, have an opportunity to, if you have a question that you'd like to uh, present to one of the panelists, if, uh, Randy will bring the mic to you. director for a mental health service provider agency and what we're seeing is an epidemic of synthetic drug usage and I'm challenged with trying to find any sort of drug screening on it. I've done research. I can't seem to find anything that because uh, they change the components in it. It's my understanding. So um, I'd like to know, I know here in this area, it really is an epidemic level. I don't know what the if it's hit the rest of the state, but I know Woodridge Psychiatric Hospital is uh, having huge uh, admissions uh, as a result of it. Um, we serve children and families at risk. We're bumping into it all the time. So, what what can you tell us that is going on on your end? What you're speaking of. Substance abuse has been, been with us um, for thousands of years. Uh, and, and we know that uh, even uh, uh, much more uh, primitive entities than, than human beings abuse substances. Um, I think about substance abuse as a market. Uh, I think about substance abuse as a market having buyers, sellers, and potential buyers. Um, and the only way to really address that market is to, uh, if you think about those, those three arms of that triangle that I just mentioned, uh, is to provide prevention education um, to uh, help folks that are tempted into, uh, into using those types of substances to give them some resistances and understandings uh, with how dangerous those substances are. Uh, you're speaking of things like bath salts or spice or, or window cleaner or K2, um, those, those types of drugs. Um, the thing is, all those drugs are, all drugs are dangerous. We have an epidemic right now of of drug overdose deaths that are largely due to prescription drugs, but the real danger is if we if we focus our efforts on one demon, if we focus our efforts on just one demon, another will arise to take its place. We really have to understand that we're dealing with a market, we're dealing with that dopaminergic reward center that I mentioned. Um, we human beings will, will, will seek out uh, that stimulus, and that stimulus, you know, we get that from from eating, we get that from uh, procreative activity, we get that from doing nice things for people. That's a very adaptive response, but when, we, when we're tempted to do something to drive into excess, uh, it typically results in damage. And, and that's what we're seeing with, with this, uh, with what you described with bath salts. Certainly, uh, there are some bills going through the legislature right now uh, that, uh, that are sponsored by different members that would, be, that would uh, work to address that. Uh, one of the things we understand with respect to bath salts um, is that we have to be very careful about how we even word laws that address them because uh, the organic chemists and the people that, that uh, uh, you know, and I don't use that word, you know, but most organic chemists are good people doing good things, okay? Um, but the, the ones that happen to be using their skills to change a molecule and make a different molecule that's not illegal. Um, uh, we, we have to carefully craft our language so we're not chasing rabbits. And right now, what we're doing is chasing rabbits. Uh, we've got to warn our kids. Um, we need to, as a community, um, say to say to sellers, um, it's not acceptable for you to sell that in our community. Uh, we won't patronize your uh, your, your establishments um, if you're selling things that uh, are likely to harm people. Um, if you if you you know. Um, uh, want to take that kind of stance as individuals, you know, the problems in the community, the solutions in the community. And, and um, government has an important role to play in addressing these issues, but what we're talking about really takes uh, a community solution. It's about what individuals do, it's about what families do, it's about what communities do, 
Um, and and once we once we recognize that, once we recognize it's not just somebody else's problem. It's not just the family of the substance abuser uh, uh, who uh, who died, or the the recreational misuser who didn't understand that adding an opiate to a benzodiazepine and chasing it with a shot um, would cause them to fall asleep and never wake up. Thus, we understand that that's just not somebody else's problem. We're all paying for that problem in, in loss of life, in children without parents, in foster care, in prisons filled to overflowing with. Uh, with people that have been convicted of drug uh, issues, as we really understand that as a community, and I think in this part of the part of the world we do, um, and, and we're beginning to understand that more and more in, in our nation. Um, but until we understand that and take control and realize that we all have to be a part of the solution or a part of the problem, um, we won't get beyond it. And we can't just pick, you know, the the, uh, the abused entity of the day and and fix that and move on and say we're done. Uh, because if you go back in time, you'll see uh, that, that that's, that's been the approach. The approach has been to demonize uh, and, and to get rid of, and then something else uh, rises up to take its place. I'm going to come at it from a different angle. You also have in the health department a health manpower regulation. Um, my company has a contract that looks at drug utilization part D of Medicare in all the states. Let me just tell you, there's a bunch of docs out there that's a pill mill, and nobody's doing anything about it. And not only that, I mean, yes, it's marketed toward the younger group, okay? There's the pill mill, and then if you think fraud, waste, and abuse is an issue because of the pill mill, or the docs, you ought to look at the ones who steal the Medicaid numbers, steal the provider numbers, write about $5 million worth in a week or two, and then they're in the Cayman Islands. So, it's a law enforcement issue also. It is a health department issue from the regulatory side. You can look through those files and see the ones that's writing 500 narcotic <laughs> prescriptions a day or a week. Shouldn't be allowed. We have one, one more question. Just the question gave you a good sense of how of the breadth and the depth of the Tennessee Department of Health. And we're charged in our department to do everything from prevention, primary prevention, to early intervention, recovery support. There are bureaus that, that work, obviously, at least during my tenure, around issues of recovery and treatment in terms of alcohol and, and drug abuse. It's now in the Department of Mental Health. But it really does speak to all that we do and the breadth that we do. Profundity of what public health really means to the public. Uh, while I was commissioner, we spent a good deal of time uh, dealing with the regulatory issues around access to uh, amphetamines, over the counter amphetamines in terms of production of methamphetamine. We spent a good deal of time really talking about and creating a, a continuing medical education for physicians to begin to address uh, as a, a stipulation of relicensure. Uh, the fact that physicians would have to be educated about prescription drug abuse. So it's a very uh, deep and uh, rich department, and you can get a sense of all of those points of which uh, the Department of Health touches. I'm concerned, as I think everybody here is, about the small amount of the health care budget that's spent on prevention, 1%, maybe 2 or 3% at most. How can we turn that around? Do you have a strategy to approach that? I was talking earlier, you know, sometimes you need really good facts and a really good plan that's science-based. Now, too often we go out in public health and we say, we need these resources to do this prevention because we're doing the Lord's work. And we are doing the Lord's work, okay? However, I don't think we have begun to collect what could be collected to prove the return on investment. Now, some people in public health get really uh, incensed that you use that term. That's just because you're done over on the private side. No. When you're selling public health to people that are in business and maybe in legislative plaza at the day, you need to come up with a better way to sell it. And a lot of that's the same thing that we tell everybody else. And that is, get your science, get your plans, 
get your partners, get your advocacy, then lobby. That's not a dirty word either, not when we're doing it. An awful lot has been done. If you, if you look at back to our record with Blue Cross, for example, we have now compressed morbidity. We're seeing people like my, like my wife's mother, who lived 78 years with no, with no morbidity. And all of a sudden they get sick and die. I hate to tell you, but that is success. That's called compression of morbidity, and that is success. This lady had 79 years of good life, and in six months she died. The preponderance of money is spent in the last few years of life. It still is. So all these fellow commissioners who are all down in the mouth about this, I, I'm a bit disappointed in that because we have done something right. And if we can at least continue to compress morbidity through prevention or whatever, uh, I don't know any way to sell prevention. I spent 25 years of my life justifying the four Washington committees about how to do it. And all I ever got from anybody, PR people who paid a lot of money for sell the steak and not sell the sizzle and not the steak, whatever that means, I guess that's the way it is. I'm the obstetrical director for the Northeast Tennessee Perinatal Center. And first, I want to thank Mr. Ward and Mr. Luna for making the Northeast Tennessee Perinatal Center and the rest of you for keeping it funded for all these years. But as in the Perinatal Center, as in, as in public health, there are a tremendous number of services that we provide that could never be funded by insurance. So I'm asking, is there a direction now looking at all of these insurance companies that states are supposed to provide, that the federal government is supposed to provide, and see if public health can't get some of that insurance money by providing the services that private physicians in business are not providing. Can you give us, give us one good example? Well, an example we have right now is I have diabetics that come in to see me uh, whose private physicians are not having them see a dietician. So when the patient says to me, where can I get dietary assistance, they go to WIC. You have to understand that things are not aligned in a way to promote optimum health. They're aligned to promote optimum health. And so the dialogue has to, I think, evolve, regardless of what health happens with health reform, if you think about the new accountable care organizations and thinking about you're going to get paid more for better health, what are the gaps in services that people are not receiving and where can they get those? And who are other people that you need to bring to the table in forming these organizations? Uh, for the ACOs in very few states, insurance companies or provider groups are having conversations with the Department of Public Health. When you start thinking about what the Department of Health can do, we need to be an equal player. You mentioned WIC. Look at all the money WIC programs have saved for insurance companies and for improving outcomes in this state. And so I think you're asking the right question. But you need to get in front of those groups to say, you know, in the future, as reimbursement changes, if you're going to get paid up front for better outcomes and better care, what does that look like and how can we engage the new partners to get some piece of the pie? One word of encouragement is that if you look at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the model of a triple aim, what one begins to see is that healthcare delivery system, hospitals particularly, are understanding that the world has changed, the winds have changed in terms of healthcare reimbursement. And the concept is to simultaneously begin to address improving the health of the public, improving the patient's experience of care, how patients interface with the healthcare delivery system, and bending the cost curve. The good news is that for the very first time, the AAA model that has been proposed and supported by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, whose former director just is the immediate past administrator of CMS, has suggested that as entities recognize that their reimbursement processes are changing, there will be resources that can be redirected uh, back into issues of upstream, proximal 
primary care and then proximal prevention of poor outcomes, working uh, really in the, in the uh, social determinants of health and the, the, uh, the elements that we've been talking about for a thousand years that nobody's been funding and there is no uh, sustainable reimbursement for that. But the concept is that a closed system with closed resources, uh, savings on the healthcare delivery system can be reinvested in more proximal preventive uh, health and population health. I, I will quickly and politically correct. I've been having these discussions for 25 years to answer to your question. You got a mandate to answer to your question. You got a mandate. And uh, I'm tired. You know, it's a, we can all talk about Obamacare all we want to. We can all complain. Or we can just, the insurance companies are, aren't making their profits by preventing sicknesses. And we've got that mandate more. My, I, we talked about this at dinner tonight. Uh, my coverage cost me $2,059 a month for a family. Finally, last year, covers one preventive, uh, one uh, a well patient, whatever we call it, health exam. For me and my wife and my are expecting this is our second year to have it. We're not going to get it done. I don't care that. I hate bottom line. We're going to have to mandate it. I think they're being locked off our emails and the packages that they have. That we can get our email. I, have, I hope my email is in, our, in the brochure tonight. I'm going to spend four days next month in Washington, D.C., staying at the home of President Obama's health care zone. And she's going to take me to the White House for lunch. And I welcome any emails you have. You have it there. Uh, uh, people who have some suggestions to her how to make all of this work better. But bottom line, it's going to take me. Let me make one comment. I don't want to leave the impression that preventive health can only be done in public. Okay? I'm in an age of Believe it or not, I'm, I, I turned 70, turned 65, whatever it was. Uh, and I'm in an age of and I guarantee that they wear my fanny out. I'm a diabetic. They do preventive health. They will pay for a medical eye visit. They won't buy the glasses. I'll pay for a medical eye visit because that's where the opathies start turning up. So there are people who are, who are doing it. If I were you, I would, some people outsource it. Uh, I happen to be at Health Springs. Some of the HMOs outsource it. Some uh, do it in house. Uh, my, my, uh, mine is being done through Vanderbilt. So, Look at sources other than public health. I mean, what you're going to have to do is, is what Luna said. You just, sooner or later, somebody is going to be attractive enough as an advocate for preventing health that they can politically get something done. That's what it's going to take. You've got to scream and holler and kick your feet. The squeak and wheel gets the all. Public health people, we use all these big words and you don't understand a thing we said. And at the end of the day, you've got to get out there and scrap for it. The same thing the coal miners do. The same thing that any, anybody who wants anything out of the legislature does. I can't remember in 40 years of being down at the legislature, anybody coming down there and wanting to give much testimony about preventing health. Let me, um, let me just say one thing. this evening to a close. But before we do, I think those of you who are regulars know that we routinely give a gift to our leading voices speakers and this evening we're going to break the tradition by having two very special gifts. Uh, one, we will give each panelist and, and our moderator uh, a nice collection of ETSU College of Public Health memorabilia and more importantly, more importantly a, a plaque designating each of them the, the title of humanitarian scholar in the College of Public Health uh, and th that that is, is our way of saying thank you, but John Dreisner, I'm, I'm going to have John come down here and then he's going to call each former commissioner down one at a time to receive a very special recognition uh, and get their photograph taken with President Nolan and uh, Vice President Bishop, please. So uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Governor Haslam and uh, my, my 22 uh, fellow commissioners in his cabinet, and the people of Tennessee, 
Uh, it's my honor to present uh, each of you with uh, a small token of, of our appreciation uh, for your years of public service. And, and Mr. Word, I hope this is just a start on, on a re the recognition of the value of, of public service and, and public servanthood uh, for you. Um, but, it, but these plaques read, uh, State of Tennessee Department of Health, uh, James E. Word, uh, BSMPH Commissioner, July 1984 to October 1988. Uh, and they say, in recognition and appreciation for your service and devotion to the improvement and advancement of the health and prosperity of Tennesseans. And it's signed by uh, Governor Bill Haslam uh, and the current health commissioner. And if you'd if you join me for a minute, I'd, I'd be honored to hand it to you, sir. Haslam thought I was a Democrat. <laughs> Why don't you get in the middle? Juris Doctor, uh, J.W. Luna, Commissioner, September 1988. You join us down here, sir. Commissioner, uh, September 1988 to January 1991. Uh, also in recognition and appreciation for your service and devotion to the improvement and advancement of health and prosperity uh, for Tennesseans. Dr. Frida S. Wadley, MD, MS, HPA, Commissioner, January 1995, February 2003, the recognition and appreciation of your service and devotion to the improvement and advancement of health and prosperity in Tennessee. Dr. Kenneth Robinson, Commissioner, February 2003 to January 2007, in recognition and appreciation of your service and devotion to the improvement of health and the advancement of health for, for Tennesseans. And finally, and certainly not least, Susan R. Cooper, MSNRN Commissioner, January 2007 to September 2011, in recognition and appreciation for your service and devotion to the improvement and advancement of health and prosperity for Tennesseans. Well. And also, um, hang on. <laughs> we also have a gift for Dr. Dreisner and for David Gregory. And let me ask all of you to give one more round of applause for these folks. Not, not just for what you've done tonight, but what you've done for 30 years, both as commissioner and afterwards. Thank you all very much. For all of you, the next leading voices will be April 5th, when we're going to do a multimedia presentation called Rethinking Food, which has something to do with what we talked about this evening. Thank you all for being here, and thanks, Dr. Nolan, Dr. Bishop, John. Dreyden.